Eiffel Tower, the symbol of Paris, was erected for the World's Fair in 1889. It was designed by the engineer Gustave Eiffel, who also designed the internal skeleton for the Statue of Liberty, which stands in New York Harbor. The tower has three floors, and bars and restaurants on the first two allow the visitor to relax and enjoy the views of Paris. Depending on visibility, the view from the topmost floor extends for almost 45 miles. Visitors reach the upper floors of the tower by first traveling up a kind of cog railway which climbs one of the sloping legs of the tower. From the first floor, high-speed elevators continue the trip to the topmost level. From the top, most of the well-known monuments of Paris are clearly visible. In the foreground is the Palais de Chaillot, and in the background, the La Défense district, the district of Paris in which all new building is constructed. The Seine winds its way through the city, and stretched out in all directions are the famous rooftops of Paris. In the far distance is the Sacre Coeur, standing atop the hill of Montmartre. Below us now are the gardens and buildings of the Palais de Chaillot. It was built for the Paris Exhibition of 1937 and stands on the site of another previous structure, the Trocadero, built by Napoleon for his son, the King of Rome. With typical Parisian concern for the beauties of the city, the authorities decided that modern buildings should be restricted to the district called La Défense, seen here just beyond the green section, which is the Bois de Boulogne. Dominating the center of Paris is the Arch of Triumph, which stands in the Place de Gaulle. Many of Paris's major avenues radiate away from Napoleon's monument. The École Militaire, the French military academy, stands at the end of the panoramic Champ de Mars, or Fields of Mars. It is still in use as a military academy today and was entered in 1784 by Napoleon Bonaparte, who left with the rank of second lieutenant in the artillery. The mechanism of the elevators is fascinating, and after a quick ride down to ground level again, we will come face to face with the bust of the builder of the tower, Gustave Eiffel. The statues which stand at each corner of the Place de la Concorde symbolize the main cities of France, and the Egyptian obelisk, which stands in the center, comes from the Temple of Luxor and was given by Mohammed Ali to Louis Philippe in 1836. Before this, an equestrian statue of King Louis XV had stood on this spot, but it was torn down during the Revolution and replaced with the guillotine. Among those who died in this place were King Louis XVI, his queen Marie Antoinette, Danton, Madame Roland, Robespierre, and Saint-Just.
Designed along the lines of the Maison Carré at Nîmes, the Madeleine was built by order of Napoleon in honor of the Grand Army. In 1814 it became a church and was dedicated to St. Mary Magdalene. On the northern side of the square, the two colonnaded buildings designed by Gabriel today contain the Ministry of the Navy and the Hotel Quillon. The pool of the fountain in the Tuileries Gardens is a popular spot for children to sail their model boats. These beautiful gardens are entered through wrought iron gates on the Place de la Concorde. In 1563, Catherine de' Medici had commissioned a new residence to be built beside the Louvre and acquired new land at the Tuileries on which he had an Italian garden laid out. The area is divided into geometric flower beds with two ramps leading up to the terraces of the Orangerie Museum and the Jeux de Pont Museum. The Jeux de Pont Museum was until December 1986 the museum of the French Impressionist period. The paintings have now been moved to the magnificent Musée d'Orsay which occupies the old Orsay railroad station. The Jeux de Pomme housed the works of Toulouse-Lautrec, Degas, Sisley, Monet, Pizarro, Manet, Gauguin, Cézanne, Monet, Renoir, and Van Gogh. The Carousel Arch, which stands outside the Louvre, was built between 1806 and 1808 to celebrate the victories of Napoleon Bonaparte in 1805. It imitates both the architectural design and the decoration of the Arch of Septimius Severus in the Roman Forum. The Louvre is the largest of Parisian monuments and the most inscrutable. It is not, as many people suppose, a picture gallery. It is a palace, in part of which pictures happen to be shown. Throughout its long history, it has served as a prison, an arsenal, a mint, a country seat, a palace, a ministry, a dog kennel, a telegraph station, and a fort. Among the paintings kept in the Louvre for the day, probably the best known is the Mona Lisa by Leonardo da Vinci. Also in the museum's enormous collection is the winged victory of Samothrace, the Venus de Milo and an extensive collection of Egyptian artifacts. The Arch of Triumph was ordered built by Napoleon as a memorial to his Grand Army and was completed in 1836. It actually exceeds in size the Arch of Constantine in Rome. On the faces of the arch are bas-reliefs commemorating the crowning of Napoleon as Emperor of France. Under the arch is the tomb of France's unknown soldier of the First World War. In the center of the elegant Place Vendôme is the column erected between 1806 and 1810 in honor of Napoleon and inspired by Trajan's column in Rome. The name of the elegant Place Vendôme is derived from the residence of the Duke of Vendôme, which was here. The opera is the largest theater for lyric opera in the world. Designed by Garnier, and built between 1862 and 1875, it is the most typical monument of the era of Napoleon III. The building stands at the beginning of the Boulevard des Capucines, so called because a convent of Capuchin nuns once stood near here. The Cathedral of Notre Dame stands on the site of a Christian basilica, which in turn had been built on the ruins of a Roman temple. Above the main entrance doorways runs the Gallery of the Kings, with its 28 statues representing the kings of Israel and Judea. In 1793, during the French Revolution, the people mistook them for the hated French kings and pulled them down, but they were later put back into place.
The two ends of the transept have splendid stained glass windows from the 13th century. The principal window in the south transept, restored in the 18th century, represents Christ in the act of blessing in the center, surrounded by apostles, martyrs, and the wise and foolish virgins. The one in the north transept, done about 1250, depicts subjects from the Old Testament, with the virgin and child in the center. Le Petit Palais, or the Small Palace, contains a large collection of ancient and modern art. It includes paintings by French artists of the 19th and 20th centuries, though some of these paintings have recently been moved to the Musée d'Orsay. The remainder of the museum is dedicated to ancient Greek, Roman, Etruscan and Egyptian antiquities. Le Grand Palais was built for the Paris exhibition. Today, art shows and exhibitions are held in the building. Part of it is occupied by the Palace of Discovery, which is a science museum, and another part is occupied by the offices of the Ministry of Culture. Four groups of statuary ornament the four corners of the Alexander II Bridge, which may be one of the most ornate and splendid in the world. The bridge commemorates the Paris Exposition and the visit of the Russian Tsar Nicholas Alexander to Paris. An excellent way to see a great deal of the City of Lights is by taking a cruise on one of the many bateaux mouches. These so-called flyboats cruise up and down the Seine and provide a first-rate view of many of Paris's greatest monuments. The first bridge underneath which we cruise is the Pont Alexandre II, which we just saw from the land. The second bridge we encounter is the Concorde Bridge, which leads from the Place de la Concorde to the left bank. The bridge was built from stones taken from the demolished Bastille. Musée d'Orsay occupies what was once the grandest railway station in all of France. Opened in December 1986, it represents the French art of the last half of the 19th century and the first half of the 20th. It now houses the French Impressionist collection, formerly kept in the Jeux de Pont Museum in the Garden of the Tuileries. The Louvre has an extremely complex history. It begins about 40 years after the foundation stone was laid for the Cathedral of Notre Dame, when a fortress was built by Philip Augustus at the beginning of the 13th century. Charles V transformed and enlarged it in the mid-14th century. Under Francis I in the 16th century, the Louvre's keep was pulled down, and after the king's death, Pierre Lescaut built the southwest corner of the Coeur Carré, or the square courtyard. 
During the reigns of the last of Valois kings and that of Henry IV, galleries were extended along the Seine. After many other enlargements and modifications, one of the long wings was begun under Napoleon and finished under Napoleon III. The old Louvre, the part that surrounds the Coeur Carré, and the new Louvre represent four centuries of architecture and when taken all together form a structure larger than the Vatican. The building which houses the Institut de France, or l'Académie Française, was erected in 1665 as the College of Four Nations. Napoleon, in 1806, transferred here the Institute of France, made up of the academies of science, literature, fine arts, and political sciences. The Institute is still the arbiter of French scholarship. The Pont Neuf, or the New Bridge, is the oldest bridge in Paris. It was begun during the reign of Henry III, but was not finished until 1604 under Henry IV because of the nearly empty royal treasury. It became so infested with tumblers, jugglers, peddlers, and hawkers that the king had them driven off. That was until the king's treasurer realized that they could be licensed and bring income to the treasury. Soon there were more of them than ever, but now all were duly licensed and authorized. The Palais de Justice, or the Palace of Justice, is a huge complex of buildings which has served an administrative function in an almost unbroken line from Roman times. The headquarters of the Roman governor of the district were here, and the building served as a royal residence for the Valois kings until the 16th century. Construction of the Cathedral of Notre Dame was begun in 1163 under Bishop Maurice de Souilly, but the church could not be said to be completed until 1345. First to be built was the chancel, followed over the years by the nave and aisles, and the facade, which was completed by Bishop Eudes de Souilly in about 1200. The towers were finished in 1245. The architects, Jean de Chelle and Pierre de Montreuil, then constructed the chapel in the aisles and in the chancel. Towards 1250, the facade of the north arm of the transept was also completed. The one for the south arm was not begun until eight years later. In 1793, during the French Revolution, the cathedral came close to being torn down. But instead, reason prevailed, and it was in fact dedicated to the goddess of reason. It was reconsecrated in 1802, and it was the scene two years later of the coronation of Napoleon by Pope Pius VII. On this side of the cathedral is the portal of St. Stephen, begun in 1258. The small rose window at the very top sets atop the beautiful large rose window directly below it, which dominates this view of the cathedral. The spire, which rises above the cathedral, is 295 feet high and was built by the architect Viollet le Duc, who was so pleased with the results that he depicted himself among the apostles and evangelists which decorated.
From this end of the cathedral, we can clearly see the dramatic flying buttresses which brace the apse. These buttresses are over 50 feet long and were the most daring architectural statement of the Middle Ages. The illustrious old Hotel de Ville, or Town Hall, is today the seat of Paris's municipal government and stands on the site of a 16th century building built in the Renaissance style but destroyed by fire at the time of the Paris Commune in 1871. The present building was inspired by the previous one. Seen here as we cruise up the right bank of the Seine is the other side of the Palais de Justice. In 1358, after the bloody revolts of the Parisians headed by Etienne Marcel, Charles V decided to move his residence to the Louvre and leave this palace to the Parliament. Visible from all over Paris, the Eiffel Tower stands 1,050 feet high. Although the tower weighs 7,000 tons, this is an extremely light weight for such a large structure. Each of the four legs rests on massive cement piers sunk deep into the earth. And as we have already seen, a kind of cog railway runs up two of the sloping legs and works in concert with high-speed elevators to take visitors to the top for the views of Paris. Standing in the Seine, across from a modern business district, is a small-scale copy of the Statue of Liberty. Designed by Frederick Bartholdi and presented to the United States by the people of France in 1886, the original stands in New York Harbor. The New York statue, which was completely refurbished and reopened on July 4, 1986, had an internal skeleton designed by Gustave Eiffel, the engineer who designed the Eiffel Tower. This small example of Lady Liberty symbolizes the link of liberty, so hard won by the peoples of France and America, and is a fitting finale to this short day in Paris. <laughs>